Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, June 17th. This is Lesson 3, and we are still in Unit 1 for the quarter. This is our third lesson in the unit, in the quarter. And the unit is entitled, God is Just and Merciful. He is Just and Merciful. From the Adult Quarterly, our lesson title is More Than Lip Service. Our devotional reading is taken from Mark chapter 7, verses 1 to 13. Our background scripture is taken from Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 to 9, and also Mark 7, 1 to 13. And our printed passage is Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 to 9. Uh, Key aims from the adult quarterly or number one, contrast Jesus' concept of obedience to God with that of the Pharisees. And hopefully you've read the lesson in the background. Uh, number two, repent of offering lip service to God while neglecting to honor God inwardly. We all know what lip service is. And then number three, commit to following God wholeheartedly and not merely conform to outward religious traditions. A lot more can be said about that than I think we're going to have time to in this session. Dill Quarterly uh, has three major divisions after the introduction. The first division is entitled, The Scribes and Pharisees Question. That's covered between uh, Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. The second division is Jesus' question. It's covered between verses 3 and 6. And then the third is, you hypocrites, exclamation point. And that's covered between verses 7 and 9. From the standard, the lesson title is, Jesus teaches about justice. Jesus teaches about justice, and very quickly, additional aims from the standard are, number one, summarize the nature of the conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees in today's lesson. Number two, explain how human traditions and institutions can hinder a person from responding to God's message. And then number three, identify a behavior that is based on improper motives and make a plan to change for a change. That is a behavior of ours, of one, one of our behaviors at least, and make a plan to change. Standard uh, out has two major divisions. Uh, the first is outer cleanliness. That's covered between Matthew chapter 15 verses 1 and 2. And then the second division is inner corruption. That's covered between verses 3 and 9. And as is our custom, let's uh, just have a brief word of prayer, and we will read our lesson text, and then we will jump in uh, to our lesson discussion. Father, we do thank and praise you for another opportunity to study your precious word. Lord, we thank you that it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And Lord, as we study your word, we pray that our faith would be increased. As our faith is increased, Lord, we pray that our obedience would be increased. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, so just in the way of a, a little background, um, the we see in our lesson today Jesus uh, once again being confronted uh, by scribes and Pharisees. And in an accusatory uh, manner, uh, they don't simply ask a question, but they make an accusation. And they basically accuse him uh, by referring to his disciples. They're actually uh, addressing uh, his inaction or action, uh, as they've done on a number of occasions, uh, in an attempt to 
make it appear that he is not uh, being obedient to the Mosaic law and the traditions of the elders uh, to tarnish his image before the people. Uh, they are concerned about their, tradi their traditions and their uh, uh, the, respect, the respect and uh, the influence that they have over the people, and they don't want Jesus to diminish that. Uh, the Pharisees, as we've said before, was a group of uh, very zealous uh, Jews. Uh, they were, and it was actually a sect that was intent on, uh, initially they began with uh, an earnest, we, we believe, intent, to, to make sure that they observed and, of course, to influence others to observe strictly the Mosaic Law. They believed that God would, would bless them uh, and would, um, uh, would uh, bring them out from subjugation to enemies if they went back to adherence to the Mosaic Law. Uh, so to make sure that they and others adhered to the Mosaic Law. They actually put boundaries around the law. They, they added traditions that would prevent people from becoming close to um, violating the law. Uh, for example, the law of Moses uh, clearly says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Well, they added a tradition that says you shall not speak the name of the Lord, period, in any context, uh, and, and other uh, traditions that uh, had nothing to do with, with the law of God. They added, uh, again, initially to prevent uh, the people from becoming, from getting even close to violating one of God's laws. Uh, and they, they justified this uh, with some claim that Moses had given some oral some law verbally or orally, uh, and that had been passed down to various rabbis who were better able to uh, interpret the law through this uh, additional uh, oral uh, understanding uh, or explanations that were given. The scribes, of course, were those that were expert in the law. They actually not only transcribed or copied the law uh, but they, they studied the law and the interpretations of it, and they were very uh, able to uh, refer to various uh, passages and actually give various interpretations by rabbis uh, on various scriptures. So they, that's a little background, and they confront uh, Jesus beginning uh, with verse 1. Let's read our lesson text. Again, from Matthew chapter 50, verses 1 to 9. Then came Jesus, then brother came to Jesus, scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands uh, when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your traditions. For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curses father and mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift by whatever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites, well said Isaiah, well rather did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. And our key verse, again, is verse 8, which again reads, This people draweth nigh or near unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So let's jump right into our lesson. Um, verse 1, Then came 
to Jesus scribes and Pharisees which were of Jerusalem saying now Jesus has been teaching in and about uh, Capernaum he's been at Gennesaret uh, he's done healing and they come to Jesus uh, having observed uh, his disciples and their behavior and uh, his own behavior very carefully again trying to find ways to accuse him before the people and so they come from Jerusalem perhaps representing uh, the high priests or others in, in authority in Jerusalem or not but there there were some 6,000 Pharisees and they all had again um, they were all looked up to they were all well respected and so they may have on their own initiative come to try and diminish his popularity or they may have been sent by authorities in Jerusalem we don't know that but verse 2 says and and Jesus uh, I'm sorry uh, a verse 2 says why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders for they wash not their hands when they eat bread so again the Pharisees the scribes and the Pharisees while asking about a behavior of his disciples are really asking him why are you allowing this so they are basically accusing him of transgressing the traditions of the elders and we don't have time to get into a full explanation of of uh, why but the scribes and the Pharisees held those traditions uh, uh, they gave those traditions the same weight as they did the scripture so because again this oral tradition that they are oral explanation that they claim to have been passed down originally from Moses was basically a further clarification on uh, God's word on his written word uh, so and, and and you know much could be said much more could be said about that why do we think uh, God re uh, demanded or commanded that his word be written that the law be written I mean, the answer is obvious so that it would not be up to personal interpretation. So everybody would have the same written word and there would be no uh, corruption of his commandments. And so the written law is what should have established the right and wrong behavior of the Israelites as it should ours today. OK, but and then there's the letter of the law and there's the spirit of the law which hopefully we'll have time to to mention as well so they come and they ask Jesus why do your disciples not wash their hands uh, before they eat bread now the the tradition of the scribes and the Pharisees was to not only wash their hands before they ate bread but they washed pots and they washed vessels and actually there's no command in the law for them to do that. There was a command uh, given to the priests to wash their hands and their feet before they minister. Uh, and they're touching some unclean things and so forth. But that was not given to the folks, to the regular people. Uh, so the, scri the scribes and the Pharisees looked at uh, this as a ceremony, a sacred, uh, an act of worship almost, uh, the very eating that they were doing. They tried to imitate or emulate, if you will, the priests in washing their hands uh, and, and, uh, and their feet and pots and so forth. Now, we know today uh, it's a great idea to do that for hygiene purposes. Uh, and you would think that maybe they were doing this for hygiene purposes, but they did not not know anything about hygiene in those days, and that was not their purpose. Their purpose was not uh, to make sure that they didn't uh, get germs or, or anything like that. Their purpose was, again, a ceremonial. Uh, and so, you know, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus just ignores... The question, he doesn't ignore the question, I should say. He doesn't attempt to answer their question with an answer. He answers their question with a question of his own. 
Verse 3 says, But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? So he asked them a question, and before they can answer, not that they have an answer, he gives an example. Okay? Now, before we get to his example, there's a, there is a question here in the uh, standard that says, which, if either, is the bigger danger, adding to God's commandment or disregarding them? How can we avoid both extremes? And some points for our discussion are in context dealing with personal obligation, in context dealing with obligations of church, of the church and a body, considering Revelations 22, 18, and 19, of course, which forbids us from adding or taking anything away from God's word. So, you know, it's hard to say which is which is the bigger danger, adding to or not uh, regarding uh, everything in God's word. So let's go on. Verse 4a uh, is uh, Jesus begins to give an example of uh, what he means by the scribes and the Pharisees transgressing the actual commandment of God, the written commandment of God by their traditions. Verse 4a, for God commanded saying, Honor thy father and mother. And we see that first in Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. Uh, he says to honor thy father and thy mother so that w it will be well with you uh, in the land. I'm paraphrasing. We can go to that, uh, uh, to that verse. It reads, Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And that verse is repeated almost verbatim to the children that actually went in to possess the land in Deuteronomy 5.16. And also we know that it's repeated in Ephesians chapter 6 when children are told how to honor their parents. Now, what do we mean by honor? Do we mean just give them respect or did Jesus mean just give them respect? Certainly to give them respect, to give them the respect that they were due. But it also means to provide for them uh, when they are old and unable to provide for themselves. We are to requite. The Bible says we are to requite or repay our parents for all that they did for us. And we are to provide for their physical needs. Uh, and in those days, I mean, there weren't nursing homes, there weren't places that you could shove your your elderly uh, parent off to. And I know, believe me, uh, it's a difficult decision for people to do today. Uh, often struggle with uh, how we would deal with 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 my mother uh, when she uh, got too old to, uh, to care for herself. Uh, unfortunately, the Lord. Uh, depending on your perspective, the Lord called her uh, at a fairly early age before she was quite 77. So we didn't get to that point. But I know many who have had to wrestle with whether to try to keep the mom in, in the home or parent in the home or put them in the care of others. But the honor means to provide for one way or the other to provide for your parents. Now, part B says, and he that curses father and mother, let him die the death. Now, if you're disrespectful and profane with your father and mother, you are to die the death. And we see that uh, verse that comes from Leviticus chapter 20, verse 9. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 9. And, and this death that they were to die, and it actually reads, uh, For everyone that curses his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. He has cursed his father or his mother. His blood shall be upon him. Now, the death that they were to die was to be at the hands of the congregation that were witness witnesses of this dishonor, this disrespect of the parents, the father and the mother. And so 
one of the problems that obviously the Jews had was, hey, uh, they didn't want to be killing each other because they were being disrespectful to their parents. And we'll talk about how they got around that in just a minute. Well, they got around that, uh, but how they got around honoring their parents, uh, we'll talk about in just a minute. Verse 5. But ye say, whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. It is a gift. What does that mean? It is a gift to the temple. It was a gift that uh, they actually promised the temple. And... We see that in Mark chapter 7 verse 13 it is actually called Corban, C-O-R-B-A-N. And it was a gift dedicated to the temple by anyone could dedicate the gift to the temple. Uh, and it could be anything. It could be their, their livestock. It could be their land. It could be uh, anything that they wanted the temple to have. However, they had the full use of it. Until they died. It was like a bequeath. They had the, or something that one would leave in a will. They had the full use of it while, until they died. Uh, and what it did was it took them, uh, that gift actually was dedicated for the temple and therefore could not be used to support the parents. So it was a way of, uh, children getting around the clear, the clear intent and verbiage of the law with regard to honoring parents, uh, and uh, and they knew that, okay? But it was a tradition, and Jesus points this out. And there were other uh, traditions. This is one of the, I think, one of the, the vilest that actually nullified uh, the law of God, the, the clearly stated in writing, okay? So, what the verse is saying is, whatever you would profit by me, and it may help for us to read that in the NIV, it says, but you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God, okay, devoted to the temple and the operation of the temple, verse 6 A says, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. From the NIV it says, they are not to honor their father or their mother with it, with the gift. Thus ye nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. And that's part B of verse 6. You nullify, you make uh, empty or null of no effect the the very commandment of God. Okay, and that is what they're doing with their tradition. The tradition was not something simply that was added to the law to make the law more stringent, but it was something in too many cases that actually nullified the clear commandment of God and it drew people away from adherence or obedience to God's law into disobedience, all the while appearing to be righteous. If, if those Pharisees or whoever dedicated a substantial a part of their possessions to the, the temple, they were looked at uh, with respect as somebody making some uh, significant sacrifice, even at the cost of their parents, uh, of, of providing for their parents. Now, verse... Uh, now, we might think about that. Uh, you know, God's word, uh, his written law in the Old Testament is clear. Uh, we know as uh, believers in Christ, we are not under the law. Uh, in fact, I often remind uh, those that I teach that we are held to a higher standard than the law. Uh, the Spirit uh, really... Uh, uh, guides uh, our motives and our intents 
uh, and we're held to a higher standard. For example, Jesus said, you know, in the law, in the law rather, uh, that God gave through Moses is thou shalt not uh, commit adultery. Uh, and uh, Jesus cited that. But he said, I say unto you, if you look on a woman and you lust after her, you have committed adultery in your heart. You know, the law says you shall not commit murder. Uh, and, and we, and that's very clear, very clearly stated in the law. Jesus said, I say unto you, if you hate your brother, you've committed murder in your heart. And what, and how do you understand that? How, how do you, uh, relate, uh, those two? Well, if you hate your brother, and your brother is not necessarily your blood brother, your kindred according to the flesh or any person, uh, if there were no penalty, if there was no punitive repercussions, uh, and you were angry enough, you would kill him. You know, if there was no law, and that's why the the tyrants, the greatest tyrants in our world, have been those who deem themselves above the law. Stalin, Mussolini, Hitler. When a man or woman attains such powers as they believe themselves to be above the law, and no one's going to punish them. The true evil nature uh, uh, just really comes out. Let's go on now. Um, so, verse 7, in verse 7 now, uh, Jesus hits them right between the eyes uh, and calls them what they are. He says, ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you saying now we all know what a hypocrite is a hypocrite is one that has two faces is one that says one thing and does another in Jesus's day during his first advent when he was here on earth uh, it was a common term used by actors or for actors if you will on the Greek stage they wore masks they pretended to be someone that they were not uh, and Jesus is using this term to criticize the Pharisees and the scribes for them pretending to honor God with their traditions, such as dedicating a substantial part of their material wealth to the temple, while using traditions to disobey God's commandment. You know, Jesus really excoriates the the scribes and the Pharisees uh, in uh, a passage in Matthew chapter 23 uh, between verses 1 and 36 and I'm sure you're familiar with it but you might read that uh, sometimes when he he really talks about uh, uh, their motives he talks about um, let me just read a few verses of it. Uh, he he began saying, then sp or he began saying, then spake Jesus to the multitude and his disciples, saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid ye observe that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move one of them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries, those are the borders of their garments, and enlarge the borders of their garments, and love the uppermost rooms in, at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the market to be called and to be called by men rabbi rabbi and then he goes on to say but be not ye called rabbi for one is your master even Christ and all ye are brethren and call not and he, he goes on but he also says that he gives a bunch of woes in the latter part of that uh, passage uh, including verse 14 where he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for pretense make long prayers, therefore 
ye shall receive the greater damnation. Now, what's that all about? Well, they pr- they prayed for widows who were losing their houses. They were the very ones who were foreclosing on their houses. That's the height of hypocrisy. So Jesus is nailing them in that passage. Read that sometime if you haven't. So in verse 8, he, he goes on uh, continuing to quote Isaiah, and specifically he's quoting from Isaiah 29, 29, 13, specifically. Verse 8 says, This people draweth nigh or near unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Now we know Isaiah lived some 700 years before Jesus, um, Jesus' first advent, before he was born. And so this is repeated behavior. It's behavior that had been repeated centuries before, this hypocrisy uh, where uh, people, uh, and, and God in that, that chapter, by the way, uh, God is, is telling the Israelites how they're going to be judged uh, how they're going to be taken captive uh, by another people. But then he tells them why. He tells them uh, in verse 13 of 29, why? And actually, um, 13 and 14 read, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Therefore, verse 14, Behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among you, among rather this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of the wise men shall perish, and the understanding of the prudent men shall be hid. In other words, he is going to judge them He's going to take away the wisdom that they think that they have in, in, in being hypocrites and being hypocrites and going through the traditions, through the motion, motion of worshiping and being righteous. Now, we have to ask ourselves, uh, how much of that are we doing today? How much of our tradition, even our worship, uh, is uh, are we doing for show? Are we doing to demonstrate or perhaps try and persuade others that we're righteous, but our hearts are far from the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to ask ourselves, sorry, we need to ask ourselves that. We need to do some self-examination, and I try uh, often to do that. And I know uh, uh, when I've sinned before God and, I'm, and I, I confess my sin with the intent of forsaking my sin and restoring fellowship to God, And we need to examine the traditions to see if they're consistent with God's word and will. Some things we do uh, have nothing to do with God's will for us, even in our worship setting. And we need to take a look at those things. We need to make sure that our hearts, uh, that uh, we believe in our hearts, uh, God's word and that we are we have a heart relationship with him. We're not just going through the motions uh, and, and, and and not really uh, honoring God from our heart. We are told to sanctify the Lord Jesus in our heart to set him apart and give him the, the special place in our hearts. Now, uh, verse nine finally says, uh, but in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. If, some, if something is done in vain, what does that mean? It means it is, it is done, it is useless, it is empty, it is meaningless. So he's saying that they're doing this meaningless worship. They're, they're worshiping me in a meaningless way. And they're teaching for doctrine. They're teaching teachings, if you will, uh, traditions. Uh, the commandments of men. That's what they're teaching. So what is he saying? These are not God's commandments. These are the commandments of men. Men have in, evil and sinful natures, and they're self-serving natures. And so the traditions, many of them, were intended to be self-serving. 
Uh, the the one example that Jesus gave where a person could declare uh, a substantial amount or of his possessions, uh, a gift or Corbin, really caused the nullification of God's commandment to honor uh, mother and father. Uh, and and so uh, we want to make sure, our, you know, bringing this up to today, that we are, again, honoring God from our hearts and not going through the motion. Uh, when we uh, give, for example, uh, it should not be uh, in a manner to be seen of others. Uh, Jesus said, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Uh, we should not be uh, attending uh, this service or that service to be seen of others. Uh, we should come uh, with hearts prepared to worship the Lord. We should come prepared to Bible studies, prepared to learn God's word and to, and to have a greater understanding of his word, increase our faith and our obedience. So we, we, we need to be, again, as I said, we need to have a heart relationship and a heart commitment uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just read a, a passage here uh, from the standard, uh, which says the result is that for both Isaiah's or concerning the, the, the quote from Isaiah, the result is that for both Isaiah's audience and Jesus's opponents, that, that being the scribes and or they, they being the scribes and Pharisees, their worship of God is vain, that is, empty and meaningless. God has no use for acts of devotion that are merely outward. True devotion to God comes from the heart. In response to God's grace, it is spontaneous. It, it responds to the grace, the unmerited favor of God. Uh, it then expresses itself in sincere obedience to God's commands. And in demonstrating that the same grace, that same grace, rather, on a daily and consistent basis, we want to demonstrate the grace of God on a daily and consistent basis. Our appreciation for that grace, first of all, and then in so much as we are children of God, we are to to share that grace, the unmerited favor with others that we encounter. Now, beyond our lesson text today, Jesus goes on um, in verses 10 to 14 of chapter 15 to explain why eating with unwashed hands does not defile a person. And I think he gives a, an even um, a more expanded explanation of that in Mark chapter 7, verses 18 to 23, and I will read uh, those quickly, and we'll we'll wrap up our lesson. Verse 18 of Mark chapter 7, and he said unto them, Are ye so without understanding also? Do ye not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him, because it entereth not into his heart? but into the belly, and goeth out into the draught, purging all meats. That's the waste, the refuge. Verse 20, And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile the man. Now, by no way am I saying we're not to wash our hands. We know about microorganisms and germs, and certainly for hygienic purposes, we are to wash our hands. But the intent of the Pharisees was not to have better hygiene, it was ceremonial. It was to appear to be more righteous than others. We could give some examples today of some traditions that are exercised 
so to give the appearance of being more righteous than others. And I'll say I'll say it speaking in tongues for one. Nowhere in, in the word are we commanded to speak in tongues. But it is a it is a test of salvation in some some denominations. And it's a, and it's and it's exercised for the purpose of appearing to be more spiritual than others, as it was in Paul's day. And he spent the 12th, 13th, and 14th chapters of 1 Corinthians talking about that, the exercise of that gift. And the tongues, of course, were not ecstatic, uncomprehensible utterances. They were other languages. But a lot more could be said about that. But hopefully you've understood uh, something of what we share today. We pray in the name of Jesus that you have and we uh, uh, we thank you for your attention, and God bless you. God be with you. Uh, please attend your worship service Sunday, and of course your Sunday school. God bless.